Mm, good to have you all for another colloquium. Mm, good especially to have our speaker for this colloquium, Joe Hundley, formerly of our department, now at the University of Buffalo, part of the uh, State University of New York system. Mm, you can see his title, so I won't read that to you. Mm -hmm. We look forward to hearing what you have to say. Thank you, Wesley. Thanks, everyone, for coming. It's, it's, it's great to be back in Southern Illinois. <coughs> so this is uh, this is going to be mentioning like and uh, some joint work with, with Dorian Goldfeld, my PhD advisor from Columbia, mainly one of his subsequent students, and Chow Chang, who's also one of his students. So uh, what I wanted to talk about first was was modular forms, uh, which well they they had quite a bit of notoriety in the '90s after a while, used to the proof for Mod last year, uh, and haven't done anything quite so spectacular since, but, but uh, fairly spectacular progress in the field of modular forms has continued since with um, with uh, Harris's work on the side of tape conjecture. Uh, and of course, the extensions of Wiles' work, Wiles proved something about um, sort of enough modular forms to get to mod last year generalization. So I'd like to just say a little bit about what these things are. So I'm going to begin with a nice space and a nice group which acts on it. And uh, the space is just the upper half plane. So <coughs> complex numbers whose real part is positive upper in the sense that one would think. The group, let's just say that it's it's two by two real matrices with positive determinant. We'll call that group GL2. Uh, the action is by fractional linear transformation. So there it is as a formula. And it's maybe not entirely obvious that that formula defines a group action. There are a couple different ways to do it. One is to compute, uh, I'll write down the definition of group action and do a bit of computation. Uh, there's another way, which is, is to embed it into uh, a complex, I guess, a projective line, projective one space. Uh, so um, you take maybe column vectors and you say that they're equivalent if they are non zero multiples of each other. And that sort of defines the projective space. And so in particular, I can think of the complex number z in the upper half plane as corresponding to the class of the column vector z1. And now things sort of make a bit of sense, because if I take z1 and multiply it by abcd, what I get is az plus b, cz plus d. But that's equivalent to z prime 1, where z prime is basically. So, um, so Z prime is the unique uh, element such that these two column vectors are equivalent in projective space. And now the fact that uh, matrix multiplication is a group action on column vectors forces uh, the formula that we had written down earlier uh, to be a group action. So I wanted to define modular forms. First I should define what modular means. Uh, it's going to be kind of a, a generalized periodicity condition. Right? Rel defined relative to the group action that we were just discussing. Uh, and what we'll want to do is take functions from the, uh, the upper half plane, the full set of complex numbers, which are holomorphic. Now, holomorphic just means that their complex derivative converges. And that doesn't look like it says much, but well, you might remember from Calc 2 that when you're allowed to approach a point from any direction and in any way in a plane, uh, the existence of a limit as h goes to zero, h has some interesting ways to go to zero, can actually tell you something. And in this case, it actually tells you surprisingly a lot. In particular, if you have a first derivative uh, with h approaching zero in the complex plane as opposed to just on the real line, if you have a first der derivative, then you have infinitely many derivatives and even a convergent power series expansion. Uh, and a nice equivalent condition, which might show up later, is uh, that uh, a function has a complex derivative if notably if it's, if it's annihilated by that uh, differential operator, where I always think of z as being x plus i y. So x always means the real part of z and y always means the imaginary part. Uh, it's not too hard to see that if you were say along the real line and you say that that limit has to be the same as the limit if, the limit if you approach uh, vertically, then the, the quality of those two uh, is true. So now for the interesting, interesting part. 
sort of this generalized periodicity condition. Well, as you know, a periodic function is sort of invariant on the line, but, but not by, you know, any shift, because that would just make it constant. But you allow maybe a, a set of shifts which allows some, some room to do its own thing before it has to repeat itself. So we like to sort of think about how to do that uh, in our new setup with, with matrices acting on the plane. And so what we would like is to have a subgroup of SL2R uh, with the property that the orbits for the action of that subgroup are discrete. So, you know, remember that this is supposed to be periodic, so the function, when it gets to another point in the same orbit, it's got to repeat itself. And you would like it to have a bit of room to do its own thing before it has to repeat itself. So that's what you'd like. Uh, a nice example from number theory is, well, you can take uh, two by two matrix, you can pick a direction. The simplest way to do period is to be on the line and sort of say, well, R, and it maybe it repeats every one. So then we'd be doing R mod Z. And, um, and so for number theory, we just integer matrices. That's going to be a, a nice uh, discrete subgroup that we'll see. Other nice examples are obtained by imposing congruence conditions. So uh, we have, for example, gamma dot n, a set of matrices where the lower left entry uh, is divisible by n or is congruent to zero mod n. There are more um, exotic converse subgroups as well. Um, and of course, there are other directions as well. Uh, for example, you can get nice examples with applications to number theory um, from quadratic fields. A quadratic field, uh, meaning a quadratic extension of Q, uh, the rational numbers, is a two dimensional vector space over the rational numbers, and that's going to give you an embedding of the multiplicative group of that field in the two by two matrix. Um, you can also have division algebra. Those are significant in um, the work of Jacques Lyon, for example. And another direction people like to go is they sort of like to ask, well, first, if I take something that isn't sort of obviously number theoretical because I'm using common numbers conditions. Right? If I take, say, a generators and relations description of SL2V, and find a subgroup that can't be con characterized using congruence conditions, will there be any number theory there? The answer to that turns out to be yes, but it lies quite anywhere, and that's just sort of another direction that I am not <coughs> going in with the rest of the talk. Then another thing that's interesting is, you know, we're sort of doing a mixture of, of number theory and complex analysis so far, and one might ask questions like, how much of this is being forced to be true by number theory, and how much of it is just complex analysis that you're using on number theory? And to address questions of that form, people like to play around with non-arithmetic subgroups of SL2R, for example, of which the most famous example is called Hecka triangle theory. But now to uh, describe explicitly this generalized periodicity condition. Well, here it is. Uh, a discrete sub you take a discrete subgroup of GL2R plus, and a nice example is SL2Z, or maybe gamma dot n. Those will be my examples later. And what I want to do is take a function from the upper half plane of the complex numbers, and it's said to be modular of weight k if when you plug in this, you take ABCD and gamma, you act on Z, you get this, and all it does is pop out this factor. That looks a little weird, right? Um, and one might ask why you don't just look at things which are invariant. And the short answer is that there basically aren't any if you want things that are holomorphic. So I want things to be holomorphic, and if I make them also be invariant, then they have to be constant. That's not uh, too easy to show, but that, that's, that's the reason why we now this isn't such a weird condition because if I go back to thinking of Z as corresponding to Z1, then, well, when you act by this, you get that, right? And then you sort of pull out the constant factor CZ plus D. So, um, so in some sense, having this factor pop out would be the same thing as saying I have CZ plus D K pops out there. And so it corresponds to being invariant by the action on column vectors and homogeneous in the fact that if you, in the sense that if you have you scale the vector by a scalar, out pops the case power of that scalar. So it's like a, 
a homogeneous polynomial. Okay. All right. So, um, so this is something I view as sort of a gener generalized periodicity condition uh, that the function has satisfied. And the first thing is to note that generalized periodicity actually includes periodicity in the x variable. So again, z is x plus i y. And you take this matrix. This is in SL2z, and it's again on n for every n. Those are my examples. Um, and it's, you know, az plus b over c z plus d. So that matrix is z goes to z plus 1. Okay. So that means, and c z plus d is 1. So your, your function genuinely satisfies f of z plus 1 is f of z. It is periodic in the x in the real variable in the x variable with period one, and that means that um, and if it's also say holomorphic, but even continuous would be enough, right? We can, we can do a Fourier expansion in the x variable. Of course, if you're just doing a Fourier expansion in the x variable, well, that means the coefficients are still dependent on the y variable. Now. An interesting note about um, that is that if your function is periodic, and in particular <coughs> factors through the math z goes to e to the 2 pi i n z. And the theory of modular forms e to the 2 pi i n z is generally denoted uh, by q uh, because it comes up so often and most gets higher in front of e to the 2 pi i. Um, OK, so you'll notice this transformation z goes to e to the 2 pi i n z takes the upper half plane and maps it to a punctured unit disk. You're correct. Yes, and it doesn't map it to that map. The n should not be there. Yeah, so the q is what I wanted, and the n should not be there. Um, and that, that takes the upper half plane and, and maps it to the punctured unit disk. So the point to infinity is now 0. I infinity is, even the negative infinity is zero. Um, and that's not there. Uh, but everything in the other <laughs> the, the rest of the open unit is going to come with plane. And so a modular function, um, is that any, a function that generally periodic uh, conditions, is said to be a modular form. First, it should be holomorphic on the upper half plane. Second, it should extend holomorphically in the Q-disk across the point zero. Um, and that's, that's what it means to avoid K. OK, so why are they called modular forms? Well, that's because uh, if you take the weight to be 2, then this um, generalized periodicity condition turns out to be exactly what it means to be an invariant differential form on the quotient manifold. Now, requiring uh, the function to be holomorphic should be able, I mean, we should be able to say something about these functions, c sub n of y. And in fact, we can, because if that whole sum is killed by the different differential operator ddx plus i ddy, then each term in the expansion is going to be killed by the same differential operator, and that tells you this about the function c sub n. Okay, so c sub n is a multiple of um, e to the negative 2 pi n y, which means that actually what we have is e to the 2 pi i n z times, well, some constant. So then we get a, a, uh, an expansion in powers of e to the, well, in powers of q, right, with constant coefficients. Now, of course, now if we look at things in in terms of the q variable, that looks sort of like a Laurent expansion, except it's going all the way to negative infinity. But now we can easily see that extending holomorphically across the point q equals 0 is precisely the only coefficients are 0 until you get to n equals 0. Alright. So, a fair question is, are there any examples of this theory? Uh, and it's not too hard to write one down. What I want to do is start with this cz plus d function, which is supposed to pop out. And notice that the cz plus d function is already invariant by a nice subgroup of SL2z. This is called gamma infinity for reasons that will be later. 
but just the, the elements of, of SL2Z that happen to be ever triangular. Um, something I just said that's not quite right, and there's something here that's not quite motivated, which is why do I want to pick K even? Uh, oh, yeah, this is the kind of the, uh, the question to make. Here's our general period is a condition, and I'm allowed to have uh, D equals C equals 0 and A equals D equals negative 1. So in that case, what I get here is negative 1 to the K, showing that F is going to vanish identically unless uh, K is an even integer. Now, here, I know that I'm going to take this to an even power. And that's why I'm invariant by uh, matrices with negative ones on the diagonal. And so what we could do is, well, if we know we're <coughs> invariant by gamma infinity, what we could do is just try to average over uh, SL2Z mod gamma infinity and produce something that would then be invariant by all of SL2Z. And sure enough, that's, that's what the Eisenstein series. I need to take uh, N to be, uh, or K to be at least four in order to make some converge. Uh, but, but then uh, adding up J gamma Z uh, as, as gamma ranges over uh, SL2Z, we get this sum. If we replace Z by gamma Z, we can just uh, use the property of J uh, to write it in this form, and out pops J gamma. This one follows from the interesting invariance condition of J. And the fact that J has this invariance condition is what I move gamma to here and pops that out. Um, basically boils down once again to looking at projective space and saying, well, if I act first by gamma 1 and then by gamma, I could either renormalize to have 1 in the bottom my column vector once at the end, in which case I'll get j gamma, gamma 1 gamma, or after acting by gamma, then again after acting by gamma 1. So there's our example, and now what I'd like to show you is the Fourier expansion of the Eisenstein series. So the Fourier expansion of the Eisenstein series we just wrote down turns out to be this. Uh, it comes out in terms of the Bernoulli number, which is uh, a fairly famous uh, sequence of, of uh, numbers in number theory, um, and, and divisor sum. Right? So sigma sub k minus 1 is uh, sub n, is you take a sum over all the divisors and you raise n, the divisor to the k minus 1 and add that up. So you can sort of see that the number theory appears organically. Um, okay. Another example that uh, perhaps better suited to the audience is uh, is theta function. So this is the simplest example of a theta function. You just add up e to the two pi i n squared z and then running all the integers. Uh, this appears uh, first in analytic number theory because the modularity of this function is related to proving the functional equation uh, for the Riemann zeta function, which counts prime. And, and the other thing is that if you think about it, if you take theta and multiply it by, by itself k times, and now the Fourier coefficients are basically counting representations of n as a sum of k squares. Um, and Moreover, you can you you can define uh, beta functions attached to quadratic form to count representation numbers of other quadratic forms. Now, beta turns out to be modular form for the group gamma naught four, but of weight one half, which doesn't make sense according to the definitions that I have here. So, if you notice, before I, I was only defining modular forms, I said of trivial multiply. And this sort of showed up before the definitions were made, and it, were, it was clear that we needed the correct notions uh, to make sense of, of theta functions. So in order to make sense of things, we should uh, extend our point of view a little bit. So what I'll do is I'll say, well, 
what I really have is a right action of GL2R plus. I have an action of GL2R plus on the upper half plane, and when you have an action of a group on a space, that gives you a right action on this set of all functions on that space. So in this case, my right action is um, that f slash k gamma is the function whose value at z is f of gamma z times this j gamma z of k. And with this way of thinking about things, what it meant to be modular of weight k for a group gamma with trivial multiplier was exactly this, that f slash k gamma equals f. Okay. Now that won't work if you allow k to be a half. Because you're going to have to make, take some complex square roots. And that involves choosing a branch cut of the square root. And there's going to be a couple times that a sign comes up uh, because of the branch cut. But what you could hope for is that maybe they're equal up to sign or even just equal up to some complex number. And this you can have. So we extend the notion of, of invariance to say, well, I don't necessarily want f slash k gamma to be exactly f. Just let it be in the one-dimensional complex vector space span by f. Let it be a multiple of f. OK, so then for each gamma in, in uh, your group that uh, f is modular with respect to, your discrete group gamma, you get a complex number theta gamma and this function, uh, which sends uh, gamma into c, small uh, function. Um, that's called the multiplier of your modular form. So then, then uh, the theta functions that we had on the previous page are uh, can be made sense of as modular forms, which have weight one half, and of course they have a non-trivial multiplier. Um, okay, so now what I'd like to talk a little bit about is cusps, right? At some point I promise four day expansions at finite cusps. And I should say something about what cusp is. So we have the group GL2R acting on the space H. This should equip the space H with a bit more structure than just it's the following subset of the complex plane. And indeed it does. What it, is, what it gives it is a geometry. So you have an invariant metric, which determines the notion of distance. And by determining a notion of distance, a notion of geodesic or shortest path between two points. And one should think of that as telling you how the space is curved, how the, what the straight lines look like. And then you also have a notion of volume. Uh, so the straight lines in the geometry that we get from this metric are exactly vertical lines and semicircles which meet the real axis at right angles. So those are the straight lines in our geometry. So in particular, if you take, take any point, you have an infinite family of, um, of straight lines through that point parallel or not intersecting your favorite other straight line. So it's a hyperbolic geometry. <laughs> so I'd like to understand a bit the space uh, H mod S L T Z, and more generally H mod gamma mod N or H mod gamma, uh, when gamma is maybe a subgroup of finite index of S L T Z. That seems like a nice tangible goal. And to understand um, H mod S L T Z, well, it's nice to sort of be able to say, well, I can think of it as this fundamental domain. So find a nice subset of the upper half plane, which maybe contains at least, at most, one point from each orbit. Um, so in order to do that, uh, it's nice to have a nice description of SL2Z. And this is sort of a classical result that SL2Z is generated by two elements, this one, which is z goes to negative 1 over z, and that one, which we already mentioned, z goes to z plus 1. Um, so I think I'm doing all right all the time, and the proof is short and easy and pretty, so I think I'll do it. 
So why is that true? Why is SL2 generated by that? Well, what I want to think about is, like I'm operating on this bottom row of CD. So I started with an element of SL2 data. So four integers, AD minus BC equals one, and that means C and D are relatively prime. So if I'm allowed these two matrices, I'll do right multiplication. I've got basically two operations. One is to subtract a multiple of D from C, and the other one is, well, up to that irritating minus sign to, to flip the order. Okay, that means I can do the Euclidean algorithm, right? Call the Q, because what do you do when you construct the GCD of two numbers by exactly these operations? Take the little one, subtract a multiple of it from the big one until the, the difference is smaller than the little one, unless it's zero. And now you've reversed the roles of little and big, so you reverse them and proceed like this, and you can do the Euclidean algorithm. And since the GCD was one, you will eventually get either plus or minus one at that position, and zero at that position. And now you're definitely in the group. Uh, now it's easy to see that you're in the uh, group generated by those 12. So based on that, it's not too hard to see what a, a fundamental domain for uh, the action of SL2Z on the upper half plane should be. The first thing is that you can shift elements by one. And the second thing is that if you have something which is inside the unit circle, you can invert and send it outside the unit circle. So uh, using uh, these two operations, you, you take any element in the upper half plane, you bring it until it's between uh, negative a half and a half. And now if it's inside the unit circle, send it outside. Notice that that operation makes it higher. So you bring it back in. If it still lands inside the unit circle, flip it, send it outside, it's higher again. And eventually, you'll get a point that is inside the strip between uh, from x equals negative half to half and outside of the unit circle. Now, I claim that that's actually a fundamental domain. And what it boils down to is that if you are uh, between negative half and a half and you are not in the unit circle, then you are of maximal height in your orbit. No element of your orbit is higher. Higher means has a larger y coordinate or imaginary part. So I need this little computation about what the imaginary part looks like. Which is an interesting computation anyway. So, of course, if I want to know what the imaginary part of that complex number is, what I'll do is multiply top and bottom by the conjugate of the denominator. <coughs> Simplify a little bit. Actually, it simplifies a lot. I did go ahead and assume that the determinant AD minus BC is 1. right? Because what you'll actually have is AD minus BC times the imaginary part of Z as the imaginary part of the numerator. So whenever 80 minus BC is 1, that's your formula for the imaginary part. And now it's easy to see that if, if you are inside the unit circle and inside the strip from negative half to a half in the x direction, um, that every other element of your orbit is at the same height or it's lower. And, and it's, it's at the same height if and only if C is 0. So that's the that you You just shifted it back and forth with the uh, Z to Z plus 1 now. Okay. So that, uh, that means that we can describe um, Z as the, the uh, basically the set of points of which are between negative a half and a half and at maximal height in their orbit. <coughs> now it's not, it contains two points from a lot of orbits because if you, have, uh, if you have a point in your orbit where the real part is negative a half and translating it by one, you get this one, uh, you get the point in the same orbit whose real part is positive a half. And if you have a point that's on half of the unit circle, then Z, if Z is on one half of this arc of the unit circle, then negative one over Z is on the other arc of the unit circle. Um, but that sort of tells me what H1, H1 SL2Z looks like. I take uh, this, this region, which I might as well draw here. I take this region in the uh, upper half plane. That's what's the center of the circle. Uh, this is x equals negative a half. This is x equals positive a half. But in fact, they're the same. So I glue them together. x axis is the x axis is this well, should be a circle. And when it reaches perpendicular, it will be that's where the x axis will be. 
not really professional. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, especially because this point to think about it is uh, this is a half root yeah. three over two. So uh, objects on board farther from the x axis than they appear. <laughs> um, <laughs> Um, yeah, so these two are really identified. So imagine they're glued together, now it's a tube, and in fact, if this is the, the negative one over two would be that point. So this is glued to that, uh, like so. So that means that what it looks like is sort of something like this. It's got two kind of special points. And then, if I look up high, it's, it's sort of a long tube, but I, I've drawn it tapering off, and that's because of the way that the metric works. Well, there's two reasons why I draw it tapering off. The first one is because of the way the metric works. See, if you're higher, then you, know, you look the same distance. Uh, because you have this y to the minus 2 factor in the metric, that means these two points are much closer together in the uh, hyperbolic metric in those right. because that line. So, uh, so we need it sort of tapers off um, to a test of that line. And all of the straight lines that, and we have this, this sort of opening when we, when we do H mod SL2C, but remember that when we thought about modular forms, we required them to extend holomorphically across q equals zero. So because we have to extend holomorphically across q equals zero, we've really compactified our uh, Riemann surface, adding in that, that, that missing puncture point. Now, that extra point, this is sort of, well, z equals i infinity, or q equals zero. And it's a pretty special point. I mean, every line in the surface <coughs> that goes through that point is parallel to every other. Uh, and such that's that's what custom means. So now I'd sort of like to imagine trying to play this game for gamma not end or for any um, subgroup of finite index, and certainly not starting over from the beginning. So what you do is say, well, if if gamma is a subgroup of finite index in, in SL2Z, and I first wanted to find a fundamental domain. Well, I would know that what I really need to do is analyze cosets of gamma in SL2Z, and these will give me a collection of inequivalent translates of my SL2Z fundamental domain. And that'll give me a fundamental domain for, for gamma. And on this level of the Riemann surface, what's going on is that since the gamma is a subgroup of SL2Z, then H mod gamma covers H mod SL2Z with one uh, layer in the covering map for each cosec <coughs> of gamma and SL2Z. And certainly what this, what this is going to look like geometrically is that, well, I had one cusp, but maybe it becomes several different cusps and they, they all map down. So uh, if SL2Z gives me something like this, well, a more general group might give me something that all of the mapping covering it. So Should I imagine that star sort of getting folded in on itself? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Yeah. Well, it, yeah. It's a covering map, so we have like maybe five, so it's going to be a five to one map. Each point has five pre-images in the top surface and the cusp all go to the cusp. And what goes to that bottom edge there? Uh, well, well because that's be glue some, it yeah. is. Well, it could be okay because when you have a finite covering map, see these these um, these are corners. The geometry is a little bit interesting, but not quite so interesting. In fact, here uh, locally it's a two to one map, like z goes to z squared, and here I think it's six to one. So a finite covering map can even sort of smooth out uh, these kinds of corners. Uh, 
but not five to one more than two consecutive. So in fact, if I'm going to have five classes, I should have some quarters on that one as well. And I'd like to sort of think about maybe what the other preimages at that point are. I mean, probably one of them at least would correspond to I infinity. But what about the others? Well, there's a good answer to that. I mean, from going, going back to our point of view, is I think of the upper half plane as a nice <coughs> subset of complex projective space, then its boundary is real projective space. <coughs> you can think of as a circle consisting of the real line and then subtracted by throwing in the point to infinity. Um, and it's not too hard to uh, see that when SL2R even acts on complex projective space, it preserves real projective space. When SL2Z acts on complex projective space, uh, it doesn't just preserve uh, real projective space, it preserves uh, rational projective space. So, you know, you're just going to have Q, you'll, you'll have the rational numbers in the um, real line and, and add one more point to the infinity, then you can have uh, SL2Z acting on that. And I'm going to skip forward and come back to the end of that slide because this is not sort of something too fancy. I mean, uh, here, uh, for historical reasons, the elements, the set of cusps, the projective line over Q. So just Q and one more point called infinity. Uh, elements of that set are denoted with Gothic letters. So, uh, at least in this context. So, A is, A is uh, think of A as a rational number, and you can act like this. Now, of course, if A is allowed to be negative D over C, which it is right now, then you're allowed to, you might get zero in the denominator, so you want a couple of reasonable conventions. The other thing is that A is allowed to be infinity right now, but the conventions are exactly what you'd expect. Here's my formula. If A is infinity, that means A over C. And if A, if gothic A is negative D over C, I have zero in the denominator. I don't have zero on the top because it was an internal matrix, and so then that then is obvious natural um, conventions. Uh, so then SL2Z acts on uh, projective line over Q, which I can just think of as reduced fractions including 1 over 0. Okay. Right, and 1 over 0 will be my point to infinity. Uh, so I can take infinity to any other point. I want to take infinity to A over C. I write a over C in lowest terms, and then you choose B and D such that A, D, and B, C is 1. Um, and the stabilizer of infinity, is, that's why it's called gamma infinity. Right? G sub X is the stabilizer of X, and G X of X. Um, so it's exactly the same we had before. And now we sort of understand what should, what should describe these cusps. I can label each of them with a rational number, or perhaps more naturally with a, you know, this, this corresponds to some group gamma, which is contained in SL2Z. And if we have more than one cusp over here, what it means is that gamma does not permute P1Q transitively. And what these cusps correspond to is gamma orbits of P1Q, or perhaps double cosets. Uh, SLQG plus gamma infinity plus gamma infinity. All right, so of course, a cusp, we sort of looked at this in two ways, and we've seen that the neighborhood of the cusp, right, the surface tapers out like that, sort of corresponds to the top of this fundamental domain. It's sort of a tube in that region. It's just a periodic function, and that should give you a Fourier expansion. So I have my Fourier expansion here, but each of these should also give me some sort of alternate Fourier expansion. <coughs> More precisely, I mean, we started off with, by saying modularity with some kind of generalized periodicity, and the generalized periodicity includes regular periodicity, and the precise version of that is that modularity for gamma implies gamma infinity invariance, and it should imply something with the stabilizers of the other cusps as well. Okay, so we can do Fourier expansion uh, at the other cusp. Although in order to make it uh, sort of work out precisely according to things I know, what you do is basically you say, well, 
every cusp can be pushed back to infinity by stepping outside of your group gamma for a second. So what you do is you choose a matrix which sends infinity to your favorite cusp. Right, here, right now, uh, I'll just follow historical convention by referring to the, the points on the projective line of a Q, Q1Q, as cusps. Okay, so we, we choose a matrix which maps uh, infinity to, to fractions. And I want to normalize it so that the stabilizer, when you map the stabilizer back, it's good old gamma infinity. Now, that means that this function, acting by sigma a, is going to be, you know, you act by z goes to z plus 1, and that's the same thing uh, as acting by the conjugate of 1, 1, 0, 1, but the conjugate of 1, 1, 0, 1 is one of two generators for the stabilizer group gamma sub a, the other generator is the negative identity matrix, which acts trivially. So you get periodicity. Well, not quite, because you're really acting by this right here, uh, sigma a inverse 1, 1, 0, 1, and then sigma a. And this is going to be an element of the group that you're modulating by construction. However, uh, it might not it might not have trivial multiplier. So here, I'm sorry, chi is the uh, multiplier system effect. So this might not be trivial, so maybe, well, it's like some complex number, and it's even a, a, a complex number of modulus one. So it's e to the two pi i something, and it's not too hard to see that it will be e to the two pi i something rational. Well, we just call that, so what we get is actually a, um, because of this, this extra factor here, you're not, exactly invariant, and that gives you a Fourier expansion that's supported not on the integers, but on a shift of the integers by this mu, which is called the cusp parameter. Um, so you can do that, you have to choose a sigma i, and what you get is, well, you're going to get some coefficients, and the precise definition, so first, we're supported not on z, but on the shift of z, and second, uh, the coefficients uh, depend on the choice of cusp parameter. Not in a very serious way, or not, it depends on the choice of the scaling matrix. Not in a very serious way, certainly if you, if you change the scaling matrix, uh, that's just going to change the uh, Fourier coefficients by a complex number of modules. Like, like and I guess the classical expansion of infinity bar tells you taking sigma equals the identity. So from now on, that will be my notation, and I guess I'll suppress the A's in this thing in terms of Fourier coefficients. That on a choice of sigma. Okay, so now some natural questions. First natural question, uh, how can I find this family of commuting linear operators that's acts in the space of modular forms? Uh, and the usual thing is to try to decompose the space of modular forms uh, into simultaneous eigenfunctions for the action of the Hecke operators. And what he was able to show is that if you take a simultaneous eigenform, then the Fourier coefficients have this nice Eulerian property, where if you if you take your fig, you take the uh, integer that's going in. So remember, if I put the identity matrix here, the cusp parameter is on that equation here, and you factor over a product of primes, um, then you can just write it as the product of the product on the outside of the uh, Fourier coefficients of the prime powers. So uh, I can start to ask whether this extended to general sigma. Uh, another thing that, that uh, a couple of people that had asked me since my first paper in this area came out was, can you get the Deline bound? So there's an important uh, bound on the growth of, um, of the Fourier coefficients attached to the identity matrix as n goes to infinity. Uh, which was proved by the mean. Uh, and there's a natural qu question of, does that extend to general signal? Um, the third natural question is, can you actually compute these explicitly? I mean, we, we, wrote, we gave explicit examples, like Eisenstein series and theta functions, and we were able to say that their Fourier coefficients at, at infinity were explicit number theoretical functions. And it's natural to ask, well, can you write down a similar explicit formulas for what's going on the, uh, for other sigmas, so you have the other cusps? 
So before uh, getting into some of the results, um, I should tell you uh, one more thing, which is what a new form is. So here's what's going on there. If you have a modular form for gamma dot n, that's such and such holds for every element of gamma dot n. And in particular, it remains true if you replace gamma dot n by a subgroup. So an element of gamma dot of SL2Z is in gamma dot 6 if its lower left entry is divisible by 6, which is certainly the case if its lower left entry is divisible by 12. So when you pass from M to a, any multiple, I mean, if you're, if you're modular for gamma dot M, you're also mod modular for any multiple of gamma dot M. Gamma dot, sorry, I should say gamma dot any multiple of M. And the other thing is, it's not too hard to check that if you uh, if you take uh, an existing modular form and you just plug in DZ, then what it does is it used to be for uh, gamma dot M, now it's modular for gamma dot DM. So, okay, so those, such forms are not new. So they're said to be old. Uh, they, came from, they came from something you already had. And, um, <coughs> and there's a natural inner product on the space of uh, modular forms. Uh, so you can take an orthogonal complement, and uh, that's the space of new forms. And the heck operator is respect to decomposition. So um, you can take, when you diagonalize, uh, with respect to HECA operators, you get diagonalization of just the space of the world. Okay, so here's our first result. Uh, if you take a new form, then you have a factorization, but it looks a little different. And what's a little different is that if you have sigma here, you get something else here, which a priori depends on both your original choice of sigma and uh, the prime. And the, the, the Um, so for any, any um, thing where we have a factorization, <coughs> but it involves for a coefficients at other cusps as well. So a few of the keys to the proof. Uh, we take our, our modular form on the upper half plane. We think of it as a modular form on GL2 of the Adele ring. Now the Adele ring, uh, well, is a product that looks like this. Let me tell you what GL2 of the Adele is. So we have a number of components, one for each prime, and then one more. This is uh, often called G infinity in the literature, but it's not the infinity that we had earlier. So I decided to call it something else today, just use of R. Um, and you can take any automorphic form for a congruent subgroup on the upper half plane and sort of put it in, in the language of uh, this group. Uh, when you do Fourier expansion in the context of GL2A, what you get is something called a Whittaker function. This is uh, another function from gl 2 a C. And the Whittaker function has the property that it's actually a pointwise product of uh, functions, you know, one, one which depends only on the real component of G, and then at each prime you get a function that depends only on the, uh, the P component of G. So this kind of identity looks pretty useful for trying to prove factorization of the Fourier coefficients. What we need, of course, is an explicit formula relating Fourier coefficients and, um, and values of the adelic Whitaker function. Uh, so that was something which, as far as I know, was first written down in, in uh, the book I wrote with Joseph Goldfeld. Um, and it's a little more complicated than you probably think. And that's why, in general, in, in our expansion, um, our product expansion of the classical Fourier coefficients, the first argument keeps moving around every time you try and switch P. More or less how that goes. Um, now, it's fair to ask, OK, but having a factorization which involves coefficients at several cusps doesn't in itself mean you don't have a factorization involving just the Fourier coefficients at your favorite cusp. And in fact, there were some previous <coughs> results of Sai and Kojima uh, establishing that under certain conditions, you do. Uh, I believe the size result is you do it and it's square free at all the cusps. And Kojima's result is you do if n is four times non-prime. 
So sort of the simplest not square free thing. Um, and what I was able to show in this case is that if you have factorization and well I, I take uh, sigma to be of a fairly simple form and then element of SL two Z and then a diagonal matrix to normalize things down. Um, and if my element of SL two Z that I have there at the bottom row is C D, then you get factorization only possibly if that divides five hundred and seventy six C D. Um, so there's some keys to the proof there. Of course, saying that you have a factorization that involves a bunch of diff different cusps, well, no, it doesn't mean you can't have one that just involves your cusp. But if you have both of them, you should be able to compare them and derive identities, which say that the Fourier coefficients at my cusp are equal to the Fourier coefficients at the other cusp. <coughs> and if you have a lot of identities that say the Fourier coefficients are the same, say you can prove that all the Fourier coefficients are the same, now you have an extra invariance, right? Where you act by the scaling matrix inverse and then the other scaling matrix, and here's another thing which leaves your, your function f fixed. Well, that means that you're invariant by more than you said you were at the beginning, and if you get strong enough results in that direction, you've proved that you're in old form. Uh, the other work that I uh, wanted to comment on is um, with, with Chao Zhang, uh, the Texas Christian, uh, the previous uh, work was with um, Goldfeld at the Columbia and with Min Lee, um, who is, I believe, now somewhere here. Um, so this is on Fourier expansion of theta functions. And, and right now we have some technical conditions which should be removable. But, uh, but here's what we have so far. So we can set our third Fourier uh, expansion really the simplest uh, theta function, you just sum e to the 2 pi i squared z. What I want to do now is in, in, uh, include a Dirac Lake factor in that formula. So you take some positive integer n, you look at z mod n z cross. Right? You take a homomorphism from that into the complex numbers. Of course, it lands in the Vn roots of unity. The Vn is uh, the number of elements in z mod n z cross. Uh, you can pull it back to a function uh, from the set of uh, integers that are prime to n into the complex numbers, then you can extend it by setting it equal to zero on the remaining integers. That's what a Dirac-like character is. And, uh, and then we have a theta function attached to that. These turn out also to be um, uh, modular form. And I believe this is with respect to gamma naught 4n squared. So here's what we can do. You assume that n is 12 times n. 12 times a prime, which isn't 2 or 3. Your Dirac Clay character will factor into uh, components attached to the primes that divide the modulus n. Um, in this case, 2, 3, and p. That's just the Chinese remainder here. Okay. Now you assume that chi 2 and chi 3 are non trivial, and since z mod 4z has only two elements and z mod 3z has only two elements, saying they're non trivial tells you what they are. They're one on one, and they're negative one on the non trivial element. Uh, and then I want to assume that chi p takes negative 1 to positive 1, which is the same thing as saying it factors through the squaring map. Well, the first thing is that the cusp parameters in this setup are always trivial. So I have 4a coefficients on the integers, not some weird shift of the integers. Second thing is off the squares, they're all 0. Third thing is on the squares, we can write down a kind of ugly formula for them. Uh, but there it is, and I'll tell you something more about it in a second. So here's the sort of setup. What we can do in that case is express it uh, not in terms of GL2A, but in terms of a covering group of SL2A. And the covering group, the way to think about that is you can't, don't really have a square root map on the unit circle in the complex numbers. You're really passing back to a double cover. Uh, so, uh, yeah, so squaring wraps the unit circle around itself twice, and for this reason, that's more or less what the tilde says, which you have to be able to unwrap. Um, then our theta function corresponds to a certain element of the Schwartz space of space of the Adels, which is the product of the classical Schwartz space, the real, and then something analogous at each prime. 
And what's important is that other than 2, 3, and P, what you have is a fixed vector. It's just fixed, right? Okay. At 2 and 3, your vector is not fixed, but uh, the group that corresponds to gamma uh, 4 n squared is acting on it uh, by a one dimensional representation, or put differently, just by scalars. So those scalars are reflected here. And uh, finally, you have P. Well, what we can say at P is that the component at P lives in a finite dimensional vector space. So basically, now I'm in 421. Right? I have operators on a finite dimensional vector space. I write them with respect to a basis. That's what P1 is. Uh, then I have some other, uh, then I have a basis that corresponds uh, to the residue classes and a different basis that corresponds to the characters. And I have a change in basis matrix. And now the component that corresponds to the integer n uh, and the character chi is picked off by doing multiplying uh, by the appropriate standard basis vector both sides. So uh, sort of basically at that, after we have the adult short space, just a little bit of discipline 421 uh, gives us an explicit formula for the uh, uh, Fourier coefficients of the theta function in that case. Um, all of the uh, technical conditions here should be removable, we think. I think if you don't have uh, a character which says negative one to positive one, you need an n here, but that's um, that's the correct way to formulate it to attach a theta function to a uh, modular form in that case is ineligible to a modular form. So it looks like all of the uh, conditions on chi in the setup uh, should be removable. Uh, you will, of course, in that situation, sort of have a chronic or product of a bunch of different matrices, one for each prime that is in two or three. Uh, in terms of some further directions, I also think one should be able to write down some explicit formulas for Eisenstein series. Um, I think one should be able to tackle the day bound. Uh, one would have to look carefully at uh, so-called super And um, maybe uh, investigate how the fine structure of the representation is encoded in the uh, Fourier coefficients. Uh, that's all. Thanks so much for your time. You maybe have time for a brief question. Does this questions uh, make sense for? Instead of Q, if you have a number number of Q. Yes. Um, so, if, um, so certainly, so the adult, so in the, when you extend from Q to a number field, the easiest thing to do is pass the adult point Q which mm -hmm. tends to be blind mm -hmm. to the ground field. Mm -hmm. um, and so on some level, the question is, uh, for people who like to work in the classical language, how much of this is written out? Um, I know that a certain amount is, because uh, I think the theory of Hilbert modular forms corresponds to, they'll be defined on several products of the upper half plane. And they'll have, SL2 of a uh, totally real number field acting on them. And one can also define things which act on several copies of the upper half plane and then the complex analog, which is an upper half space. And I think the a two-dimensional hyperbolic space, uh, a three-dimensional hyperbolic space. Um, <coughs> with an action of SL2 of the ring of integers of an arbitrary uh, extension of Q. Um, so some of that has worked out classically, um, but in terms of how much of the theory of the Fourier uh, expansions at infinity and the theory of what the notion of a cusp should be, uh, the answer to that is really I don't know. Thank you, Ken. Okay.